Yeah, my name's uh, Dave Boyce. I'm a former naval officer. I'm a graduate of the United States Naval Academy. I have a degree in control systems engineering. I worked in electronics, warfare, and nuclear engineering. And while I was in the service, I found out there is an ongoing, non-consensual human experiment that's testing a human machine interface web. So I'm walking across the country. I started out in the Atlantic coast in a place called Lewes, Delaware. And I've walked here to only uh, Illinois. I'm heading west on US Highway 50. Uh, California. I've tried to uh, uh, talk to all the newspapers and radio stations along the way uh, to try to raise awareness and I'm passing out brochures and business cards to uh, folks uh, to raise awareness for this group of uh, human subjects that are seeking assistance. You can reach me at my name, David Voigt's last name spelled B-O-I-G-T-S on Facebook. Also, uh, the Facebook page, TI in America Cross Country Walk, GoFundMe page, TI in America Cross Country Walk. And I do tweet on uh, Twitter at uh, David Voigt's, uh, or at David Voigt's 1911. Welcome back to the Power Hour. Thank you for joining us. It's all about the truth. Sometimes the truth hurts. Now, those of us who have been in this truth movement for a long time have learned about a lot of things. Some at first we thought, no, that can't be true. And then we find out it is. And then we go on to search other things. And that's why we have this huge listenership to the Power Hour full of people who question just about everything. And why? Because we've been lied to too many times. Joining us today is David Voigt. He is a former naval officer, graduate of the United States Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland. He earned a degree in control systems engineering. He worked as a surface warfare officer in electronic warfare and nuclear engineering jobs. And while in the service, David learned of an ongoing non-consensual human experiment testing a human machine interface weapon. The program is testing technology similar to those used in modern prosthetics. Um, a similar program was revealed in the 70s when the government agency was caught dosing unsuspecting citizens with LSD. We're going to be talking to him about a number of experiments, but also the issue, the main issue of our program today is the harassment, the um, non-consensual testing on people of electronic harassment. David Voigt, thank you so very much for joining us on the Power Hour today. Thank you for having me. Happy to be here. You have done an amazing thing, number one. I mean, just going as an enlisted man into the Navy and then been chosen to go to the Naval Academy, that right there says you're a pretty smart guy. You, you're doing a lot of things right during that time. And then you got your degree in control systems engineering, and you were in the military how many years, David? Uh, just about 14. 14 years. Uh, you joined after the Gulf War, so you didn't get impacted by that, which we're glad of. But uh, you've been looking at a lot of the experiments that we covered in Beyond Treason, and I'm glad to talk to you about it today. But the reason we have you here today is because you're doing a public outreach campaign. You're walking across the country to tell people about a huge problem. What is that problem, David? Uh, like you mentioned there, there's an ongoing, non-consensual human experiment that's testing a human-machine interface weapon. So um, uh, back in the 60s, there was the MK Ultra program that a lot of people started talking about, that and they were dismissed. And then eventually in the 70s, uh, it was revealed during the church committee and the um, Vice President Rockefeller's commission that there was this MK Ultra program, and it came back in 1977 and did a full dressing down in front of a, a joint committee and revealed that, you know, they had found these 20,000 documents through a uh, Freedom of Information Act request. And they, you know, during the uh, hearing, they had said that the, the program had stopped, and it was kind of a half-truth. I think they, they just stopped the chemical portion where they were testing LSD and it was like mescaline and scopolamine and these sorts of uh, drugs that would be useful in, in 
spycraft. But the project that continued was the electromagnetic portion of the uh, – it continued under different budgets and different agencies. And it's it's kind of been set up so that you can't – there's no Freedom of Information Act request that's going to reach it. It's, you know, set up under – structured under contractors and kind of what they call a, a cutout, which is an intermediary to, to move funds into a, a project. And so it's – we're just, you know, like – like I said, I got a degree in control systems engineering and where we're at with the technology, with the modern computers, the ability to do uh, brain decoding. Now, we don't know what the electrical wiring diagram for the, the human brain is, but with strong algorithms and a given input, you can look at the response of the various brain waves and do brain decoding. So if someone wanted to figure out how that's done, you can go to YouTube and search. Uh, Jack Gallant has a neuroscience lab in Berkeley, California, and in about 20 minutes, if you search Jack Gallant, functional MRI, mind reading, he'll tell you how he does that with a statistical method in the, the functional MRI machine. And so this is a, a weapon that is uh, it's bidirectional. It reads, and it also provides input. And so, you know, if, you know, the public, the unsuspecting public has, you know, no idea where the, you know, technology is, uh, you know, the, the folks that are making these complaints are just, you know, dismissed. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I, I did the normal outreach and I, I, you know, I did a, you know, told, told people around me, you know, what I knew about this and that, hey, this is, you know, we have a Bill of Rights and Hippocratic Oath and we're, you know, supposed to be following the Nuremberg Code, following the, um, you know, trialed at Nuremberg after World War II. And, uh, there's a group of people that are being experimented on again, you know, after the Tuskegee experiments and MK Ultra and atomic radiation experiments, how, you know, there have been public apologies by presidents and it's been denounced. And I'm just not, I can't believe that it still goes on. And it, it just takes so long for the public to catch on. And, and we really, oh, yeah. really need to help these folks. You know, I have said for a so, long time, in the research that I did after the Gulf War, but I have said for a long time that the VA is the reason that they are able to continue these experiments because they can keep all of these people sort of secluded in one area called the VA system, and then they can continue the experiments from, I don't care if it's Vietnam or the experiments that are going on today, whatever, but these people are out of the view of the general medical community so they don't really know what kind of experiments are taking place. And that is why they're able to keep the idea that there is no Gulf War illness or Agent Orange was not a problem for so long is because of the VA hospitals. Now, if they were forced into a TRICARE situation or using regular hospitals, then the game would be up to a certain extent. And this is the way they continue the experimentation and the documentation of all these drugs that were used. Uh, you know, the the thing about Jacob's Ladder, that story, uh, the movie that came out. The drugs that were used on these people, unsuspecting without their consent. All right, your situation is not drugs, but it is electronic harassment, you say. Tell us what electronic harassment is. And, yeah, tell us okay. what electronic harassment is. Okay, so the body works on bioelectricity. The minor amount of, of energy that's required to um, interface and fire neurons. And we've been um, doing research in that, you know, all, since the end of the World War II. And they, they had this weapon that interfaces with the, the human body, and it can render the, all sensations. So it can re- render the sensation of touch, hearing, sight, smells. It's just a complete decoding of the brain information because the uh, computer science has, you know, has has come along, and they've gotten such you know great funding and uh, research support um, through the 70s, 80s, and 90s that they they've been able to create this weapon that they were looking for uh, during the 50s and 60s. And so, yeah. electronic harassment is just the influence of the body uh, remotely, and so the, these folks that are affected will feel, you know, unwanted sensations of touch and hearing. Some will complain of, of visual information as well. Okay, you got out so of the kind military. Of like augmented reality for those that are familiar with, like, the Oculus Rift or the Google Glasses effort. Okay. You, uh, ETS, you, you left the military what year? 
In 2010. 2010. When did Correct. you consider that you were being electronically harassed or electronically stalked? When did you feel that that began? Well, I, I took the opposite approach. I purposely tried to get myself in this system because you can't, you know, there's espionage laws. You can't just go grab the documents and, and you know, start looking through them and, and talking to people about them. So I wanted to do it, in a, you know, the only legal way I knew how was to try to get myself into the, the program. And so I used a uh, kind of a civilian approach. I had read a couple of books uh, while I was deciding which career path I wanted to take. And I had learned that some of this technology has made its way into, you know, the corporate world and, and folks with uh, some political horsepower and wealthy individuals are able to get this electronic harassment as a sort of service. And it was right there, you know, in black and white as I'm reading these, you know, uh, nonfiction and semi-fictional novels that, you know, this is a problem. And, I you know, I'd heard about a little bit about it growing up and uh, knew that it was true from, uh, my my time in the service, and so I tried to get myself into that program. Okay, now wait a minute. Let me stop you here. Let me stop you because I think I'm a little bit confused. You learned about electronic harassment in the military. You learned about the program. Yes. Did you read a protocol? Did you read a uh, uh, program? Did you? How did you come across the information it's, on electronic it's, harassment? It's known information. They compartmentalize this stuff, but you know, at the academy, they have a lot of cross disciplinary. I had a NSA instructor, a guy that teaches you naval law and stories that he'll tell is going through that course. And then class in uh, ethics and moral philosophy. So you just have exposure to quite a different, you know, people from different uh, warfare areas. And over time, I was just, you know, I had heard about this, you know, initially in high school. And then I, you know, started picking pieces together and I realized, oh, this is kind of like a, like a decentralized electronic sort of gulag. And it turned out to, to be true. And so I read from these nonfiction novels that there was a problem there and it needed somebody needed to address it. And then later on, you know, in the military, you know, I, I read quite a bit more about it. Okay, and, we're going to uh, come back after this four-minute break with our guest, David Voigt, and find out what electronic harassment is. He wanted to get into the program, ladies and gentlemen. Did you catch that? We'll be back. Stay tuned. Our guest today, David Voigt, serving in the U.S. Navy and then deciding he wanted to become part of this program to find out what it was all about. Now, am I understanding that correctly, David? And we do salute you here at the Power Hour. Am I understanding you correctly that you wanted to join this so that you could be a part of the program? Yes. You know, this this is one of those, it was a situation where, you know, there's you can't just grab the, you know, grab the documents and go to the New York Times. So I had to figure out a way to legally figure out what the heck is going on with, with these folks that are claiming electronic harassment and, and group intimidation tactics. And so I tried to come up with kind of a clever way that I could get myself into the program, figure out what it's all about, and then escape at the end of it. That's been the tough part is the, uh, trying to get people uh, interested in, in researching the topic and helping the victims because it's, it's certainly a noble thing. You know, with uh, a little bit of research, people can figure out how this works. All right. What is electronic harassment? How would any of us recognize if we were being electronic, uh, electronically harassed or, or um Well, you don't. Like, or... Initially, you don't. You figure out when you're allowed to know. That's kind of the insidious. Uh, it's a human-machine interface weapon. Um, and, again, I, I'd encourage folks to take a look at the work of Dr. Jack Gallant or uh, folks like uh, Miguel Nicolelis, who's doing uh, hive mining research down there in Duke University, and he was also the one that built the exoskeleton for the quadriplegic the opening kick of the 2014 World Cup. So electronic harassment is interfaced with the body's central nervous system and, and providing external input. And so initially, you know, people will notice maybe like a muscle twitch, and then over time it'll become a, you know, an unwanted sensation. People will understand, okay, we can record a sound, and we've been doing that since the 19th century, and you can play it back, and we can talk to someone over the phone from two states away, or we can record visual information and, you know, record a movie, and you can play that back at any time. This is the, the transmission of, you know, all sensory data. So you can transmit touches, audio information, visual information, and so these people are being harassed through 
different interface into their own nervous system. All right. Let's. Okay. So in 2010, you left the military, but then when did you first notice that you, or when did you first become involved in the program of electronic harassment, and what did they call it in the military? Uh, in 2003, I actually started pursuing this, trying to get into the program, asking questions, you know, communicating with people who might have access to it. And then the electronic portion uh, was 2012 for me. So it was after you had been out of the military then that you were being electronically yeah. harassed. Did you keep contact with the military? Did you actually tell them, look, I want to be a guinea pig? I want to be a part of this program? Yes. Yes, I did. Yes, it is. Oh, really? It's okay, kind of so a, yeah, there, there are people around you, they warn you, and they're like, you know, you know about this program? Like, yeah, I'm trying to get into it. We have to stop it. Okay, what did you they don't. call it again? What did they call it in the military? Psychological warfare. Oh, it's part of psychological warfare. Is it under the department yeah. of DARPA? Is it under DARPA? It, it, you know, it's going to be a lot of folks. So they're going to have, uh, you know, guys out of NSA that, that do this stuff. And there'll be there'll be more of the the tech end of it and electronic signals and that sort of stuff. And then you've got, of course, guys out of the CIA that will do this abroad. And then FBI did this under their program COINTEL Pro. A lot of people remember where you know they uh, bugged Martin Luther King Jr.'s apartment and then sent him a horrible letter demanding that he commit suicide. And that's that's kind of what this program is. It's a forced suicide, forced homicide. Wow. It just made, can it be used the target for life okay. horrible? Can it be used in people like Orlando? That's my question when we come back. We'll be back with our guest today, David Voigt and the Power Hour. Stay tuned. This is Joyce Riley. We'll be back in three minutes. We're talking to a gentleman here who has been recommended to me to be on the show by a number of people. David Voigt is his name. He joined the military, the Navy, went to the Naval Academy. But then he wanted to be placed in the electronic harassment program. He was placed in that program, and now he's traveling around the country to let people know about the program. So before we get to the Orlando issue, David, why is it that you got involved in the program, you consented to the program to become a guinea pig, and now you're traveling around the country to tell people about it? Are you sorry that you made that decision? No, you know, the Academy has a pretty robust uh, character development program. So they, they, you know, you have a class in ethics and moral philosophy, and you have a naval law class. Humanities classes, you'll read from Solzhenitsyn and learn what happened in the gulag in Russia. And and just from all those experiences, you you just kind of get a strong moral compass. You know, when you're presented with a situation right or wrong, you're able to look at all the facts and, and make the right choice, and this is the right choice when you've got you know thousands of Americans who are being tortured with a human machine interface weapon. I mean, it's a pretty easy decision that it has to be stopped. Somebody has to step up and say, you know, this this program is not legal. It has to be brought before the Congress, and that. Okay, so you joined it, but now you're trying to say that it needs to be stopped. So you found out what it was all about. Through being yeah, in the I program a, yourself, I knew a few things, but I, you know, it's, it, you know, as an engineer, you you go right down to the you know equipment problem or the the system problem or admin problem, and, and you critique. You know, you you observe and look at the information and look at the trends, and you critique the information. That's this is what I did in this this situation. I got into the program. You know, I looked at all the the literature on the topic. There's something like 50 books that I found on this topic. I've read maybe 12, and then. I recommend uh, five or six to people that, you know, they can read in an afternoon or two and understand. Okay, how, what how are some of those works. books? What are some of those books okay, that so, people might want to read? Uh, to understand this program, there's uh, there's four or five books in this topic. I, I'd start with uh, Dr. Robert Duncan's How to Tame a Demon, and he's interviewed a thousand or so of the victims, and he's boiled it down to 80, 80 or 90 pages of what are the most commonly asked questions by the people that are in this non-consensual Experiment. Um, it can be re- read in a couple hours. The second okay. one is Guinea Pigs by Dr. John Hall. He's a doctor out of San Antonio that uh, come across this program as well, and he's trying to. He's done like I think a decade worth of outreach, trying right. to let people know, hey, here we go again. Mm-hmm. And then uh, uh, I go back to Dr. Robert Duncan. He's more of a technical manual on this topic called Project Soul Catcher, 
that details the science behind this technology. And then for a, a novelist approach, I'd check out uh, 1996 by Gloria Naylor. And then uh, there are four research scientists that are doing work with this technology in, the, in an unclassified setting that you can get on YouTube, look at their work, and understand how this program works. The first being Jack Gallant out of uh, University of California, Berkeley. If you go is on that, the Internet and search Jack. Okay, is that spelled Gallant, G-A-L-A-N-T? G-A-L-L-A-N-T, Jack Gallant. Okay. okay. And if you type in mind reading, functional MRI, in 20 minutes you can explain how the passive portion of the, the program works. Then I'd look at Miguel Nicolaitis' work out of Duke University. He does hive mind research. You know, he published in Nature Neuroscience uh, last fall, uh, showing how this, you know, this hive mind technology works with rhesus monkeys and rats. And you can kind of expound that if you look at Robert Duncan's work, he came. He's a guy that has multiple degrees. Came out of the CIA and is telling people that you know, here's the military application of this technology. Okay, I now let me at, ask you. Uh, okay, okay, that's a that's a lot to start with there. I appreciate all that good information. Mm -hmm. But why is it that you're not afraid now? You're traveling around the country. You're wanting to. You're walking across the country. You've got a GoFundMe account, which I want you all to consider donating to. But you're doing this because you want the program stopped. Why are you not afraid that they might just kill you or do away with you at a time when you're trying to tell how bad this program is? Well, your fear doesn't come into it. You know, it's, this is an issue. You know, you're a mil you know you're a military officer. You learn from you know World War One where you know you're doing trench warfare. They blow the whistle, and then that's sometimes that's it. You know, that's the last time you get out of that trench. Or you know, World War Two. I mean, you know, the, the lives lost in that. I mean, it's just your function in society. You're you're there to protect the people, and so fear doesn't really become part of it. You just have to well, I'll tell you what, if, try to do if the best I, you can. Well, I appreciate that, but if I were being uh, uh, slammed by electronic harassment, I was an Air Force officer, I can assure you I'd be scared if if all this stuff is coming at you. And that's what we need to get to in just a second. But the question I ask you regarding um, could it be done to could it, could a killer be created this by this um, yes, and by it has. this equipment? And everyone in America has seen it. You, you've seen a couple of the. I get, now I get scolded for this whenever I try to talk about it because this, this group calling themselves targeted individuals. They don't. Some of them don't like it when you talk about this, but it needs to be said. There's evidence that a couple of these shooters were in the program, and not only knew they were in it, and they were trying to draw attention to this issue because every time you know there was just no outlet, no one would talk to them, and they would get dismissed whenever they tried to discuss this horrible crime. Was one of them the Navy so, shooter yeah, in Maryland? Be, you know it. What's that? Was it one of them the Navy shooter in Maryland? Yes, the, Na the Navy shooter and then the shooter at Florida State University. And then I would also, I, from what I've seen, uh, there's a gal up in Toronto that's on trial for stabbing another girl. But her, I think her, I don't know how to pronounce the name. I think it's Rohini Basir. But I, I looked at uh, what she she wrote, and it looks like she's probably in this program as well. Now, how but, can you tell? Yeah, it, how it, how can you tell? I'll tell you what, maybe uh, Justin needs to bring my volume up a little bit because I think we're kind of stepping on each other. How can you tell from somebody's writings or what they say if they've possibly been involved in this program? Okay, so it's, it, you know, it's a, a human-machine interface weapon. If they start talking about you know, physical sensations, and then it, it, there's a psychological warfare portion to this. So they, they try to confuse these people, and it's one of like five to ten storylines that they'll, they'll follow to get people into the, you know, they want them fighting with their neighbor, they want them fighting with their family or, or mad at the government, that that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but it, the big thing is, you know, like in the Navy Yard shooter, he he wrote on his weapon, this is my, you know, frequency weapon or something. He etched yes, it on, yes. his, on his weapon so that people would know, like, this is why I'm doing it. I'm being tortured. I'm in this program. They're testing this human-machine interface weapon. And it, it literally is. It's, it's 20, you know, just like a Wi-Fi signal or a GPS signal. This program's worldwide. You can't escape it. You know, so it's it's 24/7. You know, if you're identified as a potential outcome, they ramp it up. You can be tortured 24/7 anywhere wow. in the world. You cannot escape it. Now I want to open up the phone lines. So 
Okay. There are some people that want to talk to you, I know. So mm-hmm. give us a call at 855-995-6923, 855-995-6923. Now, if you had your choice today that you could tell them or write a letter to them or uh, file a lawsuit or whatever it would take to say, I want to be out of this program, would you do it? Uh, sure, that's that's the ultimate goal. You know, with the, the Tuskegee experiment, they were easy to identify. They, they were able to say, okay, these are the people that are in the uh, program. I would love to be able to get, you know, get the word out and then get all the, the targets rounded up and then get them some basic coping mechanisms and then do the standard, you know, activism on, that people do on, on any topic. And like with the smoking or asbestos, get them some sort of legal repercussion for this horrible crime that's been committed again. Right. So we know that there have been a number of experiments the government has done under COINTELPRO and under MKUltra, et cetera. There have been a number of experiments. This is just one of them. But I think people would be interested in knowing what kind of equipment, what the equipment is called, how this affects you on a daily basis. How many times are you targeted per day, and what has this done to your life? Let's start with uh, what kind of equipment is used. That, the only people that are going to know exactly what equipment are the ones that are trained on it. So this, this is one of those things that unless you uh, were hired on in this program and you've had, you know, three, three years if you're an operator or if you were, you know, a scientist and developed it and you were, you know, took 10 years with the uh, R&D group, those are the only people that are going to know exactly what the technology is, is called. Okay. And we're trying to get, get to the point where we can get a legal opinion that will say, you know, if you worked on this, come forward because you're protected. The you know the national security button doesn't work in this situation because people are being tortured with it. That that comes first. Okay, is this part but of the voice to skull? People. Is this part of the voice to skull technology? Yeah, and there there are three of you know three or four technologies that I know of. Um, one of them being ultrasonic heterodyning, which uses it's like the audio spotlight. If you research, you know, if you Google audio spotlight, that's what that technology is. There's one called bone conduction. Um, one of the major news out, outlets uh, published on that last fall as a, you know, quote, unquote, new discovery. You can find that in the, um, you know, kind of like the special warfare books where, you know, some of the guys that wrote books in the 90s, they've had that since, you know, at least the 80s and 70s where they were using in, uh, you know, special warfare and spycraft. And then the other one is the, called the microwave hearing effect or the Frey effect. And that one's a uh, remote uh, way of communicating with a person using okay. uh, differential spatial effects based on heating and cooling. Okay, how does this impact your life? What does this do to you okay, on a daily so, basis? So, say, you know, for the, the folks that get the audio stuff, they can just talk to them all day. You know, they, you know it'd be a, as if you get someone on the cell phone and you can never turn it off. They can just talk talk them to their death. Mm. Mm. Or the people that, that get the tactile stuff, it's the most horrific, disgusting stuff unmanageable. You can read through Diane Feinstein's report on the torture tactics at the beginning of the war on terror and they've had some more information released. It's that's what it is. It's a trauma based uh torture program. Okay, so and we're where... literally being tortured. Where did they train these people to do this, or where were you involved so, in the program? It's, it's going to be guys that work in, like, uh, special warfare, psychological warfare, interrogations, and they're going to select they're going to select certain people that are going to be willing to, to do this or take some bucks and be quiet and, or, you know, have the fear in them, you know, having known what happens to folks in this program. And, you know, they'll probably have a military career or maybe a, you know, CIA, NSA career. And then they'll move them into a contractor position. And those are going to be the people who uh, do some of the oversight. And then they hire out folks locally to help with the organized intimidation and community-based stalking. Okay, what, uh, but you said also that when I asked you at the bottom of the hour, uh, before the bottom of the hour break about Orlando. So someone could have been trained like this. Would he normally have a military background? Uh, in, in this, in this situation, um, 
I don't know anything. I haven't heard any information that would suggest he was in this program. I, all I know about is the you know the Navy Yard and the Florida State shooter. Um, but if if they're trying to make a shooter, I guess it, it helps that they have some firearms training. But this, this is it's just a simple you know they're they're torturing this person, and if they take you know ten thousand people and they torture ten thousand of them, they'll probably get a handful of them that you know will do anything to make it stop. And that's kind of the, the folks that they'll they'll oh, use wow. whatever programs they're they're developing. Okay, let me go to Marion in Baltimore. Marion in Baltimore, you're on the air with our guest today, David Voigt. Go ahead, please. Yes, uh, David, I, I've been uh, a victim of this uh, electronic harassment, uh, this torture for the last six or seven years. And uh, there's all kinds of things they can do with it. They can burn you. They can sting you. They can give you uh, massive headaches. They can make you go to the bathroom. Uh, just so many different ways. You know, one thing we haven't mentioned, how about sleep deprivation? Did they, when, was yes. that part of your program, sleep deprivation? Yes, they, they can cause you to stay awake, or they can give you a massive headache. There's just so many yeah, I've heard, you know, a lot, a lot of people, you know, they, they just want, they want to go to bed. You know, it's just one of those things they, they just want to go in there and go to bed and kind of shut off the world. And that's kind of one of the worst yeah, places you can be in this program because you know, you're like just a you. stationary target. Okay. Yeah, let me, just... Marion, let me thank you very much for the phone call because, um, hearing from other people that are having the same situation, and I probably heard from 25 people that have contacted me in the past. And some of the stories are really strange. Okay. Some of the people are a little bit strange. And sometimes I okay. wonder how many of these people have been involved in actually uh, being targeted and how many people in the country do you think are being targeted. Um, i got to uh, move on, Marion. Thank you for the phone call. All I'm right. going to go. Thank you very much. I'm going to go back to David after this break to find out how many people he thinks are involved in this program and how can we support him on this trek across the United States. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. Joyce Riley in the Power Hour. David Voice is our guest. Final segment of the Power Hour. I'd like to have uh, David back again on the program because there's so much that we want to ask him and that you want to ask him. I hope we get, have time to get to everybody here. Let me, uh, first of all, uh, real answer, uh, real quick, easy answer. How many people do you think are involved in this program, David? I, you know, to be honest, I have no way of knowing. I rely on the people who have done uh, surveys of, of the the group in the past, and they, you know, say a conservative. Ask, one of them says a conservative estimate is four to ten thousand people. Another one, you know, suggests that it's something more like a hundred thousand. Wow. Um, for us, you know, for for victims, it's just just something that's unknowable. We're going to need someone that that worked in this program to give us a little bit more information. Okay, let's go to Cecil in Tennessee. Cecil, you're on the air. Go ahead, please, with David Voigt. Hi, hi Joyce. I hi think there. there's something. Thank you. I think there's something to the electronic warfare aspect against individuals. But uh, Mr. Voigt's uh, was, answer was non-responsive to the location. Uh, the military campus or other uh, training facility. And I wonder if Mr. Voigt might be able to specifically tell us uh, where these places were. I, I myself had taught at Revere Hall at Fort Devens years ago and also at Wachuca in Arizona, the home of intelligence and in the uh, NSA and electronic warfare subjects. I wonder okay. if you might tell us uh, specifically I- where. Thank you. So I, I, my answer, I would look at, there's a guy named Colin Ross that did research on the uh, MK Ultra program. Yeah, we've I, had him on before. Yeah. And, you know, I, I would say it's going to follow the same format. It's going to be a distributed thing where you're going to have, you know, small groups in, in various institutions, and they're not going to know the full scope of the, the this issue. And then you're going to have cutout organizations that, that provide funding to the various groups that, that do this. So okay. it's it's geographically. I think it's going to be isolate. It's going to be a, a regional thing, so a handful in each each sort of region. Go ahead, Cecil. Where were you trained at, Mr. Avoid? Specifically, you know where you were at. Where were you at? Naval Academy, and then on uh, the destroyer Bentfold out of San Diego. 
Uh, so okay. you were already in the electronic warfare program at uh, the Naval Academy. Is that what you're saying? Uh, you know, not not well, kind of not electronic warfare, but I, you know, my control systems engineering uh, concentration was in um, signals. So I, you know, a little bit of work with analog digital signal analysis. Okay, but the, when did you, you volunteer? Know, when did you volunteer to be a guinea pig? What year? I started working on it in 2003. Okay, when you entered into the military. No, that's not when you entered into the military. No, in 97 I came in. in okay, where were you in 2003? Where were you stationed? I was at the Naval Academy. Okay, so there's our answer. All right, thank you very much, Cecil. Let's go to Dennis in Virginia. Dennis in Virginia, you're on the air. Final call with our guest today, David Voigt. Go ahead, please, quickly, Dennis. Yes, David. Uh, the only thing I can tell you is that you you are only touching, you're only scratching the surface uh, because we're talking about not only electronic harassment, we're talking about electronic mind control where they can implant thoughts into your own head that override. Yeah, that, 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 yeah electronic harassment is kind of a misnomer. It's, it's the interface of human beings and, and machines. That's where the technology is. It's a bi-directional human-machine interface. Okay, I don't have I don't have very much time, so I'm gonna I'm just gonna read a couple of well, books. Well, we're out of time. I was, unfortunately, we'll have to do this program again, and I hope you're uh, paying. You, you can uh, uh, listen, Dennis, when we do it again, because I want to have David back on. There's too much information here. I want you to go to the guest section, find out how to support him on his GoFundMe page around the country. He wants to tell the world about this. Let's support him. He comes from some really good, respectable people, is how I found out about him, ladies and gentlemen. You all have a blessed day, and I hope it's better for you, David. David Voigt, thank you for joining us in the Power Hour. Awesome show. Thanks for a having lot me. Appreciate to it. think about. Absolutely. Uh, we want to have him definitely, Catherine, back on again. Have a blessed day. We'll see you tomorrow. Yeah, bless you all. It's all about the truth, and some of it's pretty uncomfortable. We'll see you tomorrow. We love you at the Power Hour. A former naval officer and graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy, David Voigt, is voyaging across America from Delaware to California along the American Discovery Trail and U.S. Highway 50 to raise awareness for a growing group of victims, including men, women, and children being assaulted with electronic weapons. He started his journey in May and plans to take several months to complete the journey, educating the community wherever he goes while carrying a portable backlit billboard capable of scrolling text messages. I've got David on the line with us now. What a valiant effort, David. Where are you now? Hey, George, I'm in a place called uh, Gray Summit, Missouri. It's just a little bit west of uh, St. Louis. I know it well, very close, and of course, uh, nine years in the Navy as well, so thank you for serving. Now, tell me a little bit, how did this all start? How did you decide you wanted to raise awareness to this kind of electronic assaults? Well, well, like you said, I'm a a former Naval officer, graduate of the United States Naval Academy. I have a degree in control systems engineering. I worked in electronics warfare and nuclear engineering jobs as a service warfare officer. And while I was in the service, I found out there is an ongoing non-consensual human experiment, and it's testing a human-machine interface weapon system. So kind of in practical terms, it's the same sort of technology that's used uh, with the, the modern prosthetic limbs. So uh, for somebody that has no background in this, this uh, type of technology, if you go to TED.com, they have these TED Talks that for, stands for Technology, Entertainment, and Design. You know, 10 to 12 minutes, you can uh, get some information about a topic you've never heard about. And if you go to TED.com and search technology that can hack the brain, there's six um, TED Talks in a playlist that within one hour you can get an understanding of exactly how this weapon systems work. This is frightening, so it, David. It's frightening. It is. It's it's it, it's absolutely amazing in that, you know, with uh, like before the 2014 World Cup, they were able to get a guy that had been in a, you know, as a paraplegic had a motor it was in a motorcycle accident. They built him an exoskeleton and were able to, you know, through brain decoding allow him to through thought alone stand up and kick the opening kick of the World Cup. But on the opposite side of the spectrum, there's a group of people that are in a non-consensual experiment. They're calling themselves targeted individuals, and they are literally guinea pigs testing this technology. David, 
there are hundreds of thousands of individuals in the United States that apparently may be subjected to this. How long has it been going on, in your opinion? At least since World War II, they started the experimentation. There was an experiment called uh, Project Chatter. It was a Navy experiment. And then they moved on to um, names like uh, Artichoke and Bluebird. And uh, then they went on into the MK Ultra program that ran for a number of years. And then during the 70s, there was a uh, congressional hearing on this topic specifically. And they, they sort of revealed some of the things that they were looking into. They said they stopped the experimentation, but it didn't. It just continued. And it's involved into uh, what these uh, targeted individuals are experiencing, which is kind of a, a remote interface with the bioelectrical system of a human being, you know, without their consent, without ever telling them that they're part of an experiment. And it's really topical now because there has been uh, now five major uh, shootings related to, you know, the people that are part of this test bed, the most recent one being the uh, Baton Rouge shooting, where uh, the New York Times, uh, CNN, and the Kansas City Star have all reported that that shooter was part of this, you know, that it's self-identified part of this program. As a targeted individual. So you're almost halfway there. You're from Delaware to California. Are you walking, taking a motorcycle? What are you doing? I'm walking. I have a, uh, I've got my beagle with me. I've got a backpack. <laughs> you, you've become Forrest Gump almost. It is, you know, and that's, you know, people have, you know, commented on that. And, you know, that'd be great if we had people that kind of followed this um cross-country walk and you know this is a, a you know it's a new kind of weapon system that needs to be monitored in the same way that we monitor you know like atomic you know inter- we have an international atomic uh energy commission and atomic weapons inspectors that we need to have an international agency that monitors neuro weapons it needs to be public knowledge that this is a reality now you can go to te- you know these ted talks and look at that you can look at uh, what jack galant uh has published out of his neuro science lab there at the University of California at Berkeley and you know people can just search that and see how they do you know basically mind reading if you search Jack Gallant functional MRI mind reading University of California at Berkeley in YouTube you'll come come away with a you know a few YouTube videos explain exactly how sure. that's done well we're going to follow your your progress yep. and when do you expect to get to California David at this I've got pace? about 90 more days of hiking and it'd take me at least until uh, Christmas to finish that up without uh, any break. All right and are you getting media coverage along the way? Yeah that's what we're trying to do we're we're hitting all the small small town newspapers and radio stations trying to create a historical record that you know there were people here in this time frame 2016 that knew about this crime that knew that this was happening. And they were trying to do everything they could do to bring it to the public. Society. Okay, well, we've got a link on our Twitter, to your Twitter, Facebook, and you have a GoFundMe page. Be safe, keep walking, and uh, we will periodically check in with you as we reach this 90-day, uh, right up, to, uh, right around Election Day almost. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, David, be safe. That's David Voigt's an incredible story, a story that we have covered on Coast to Coast for years now about electronic assaults, and a lot of people say, nah, come on, that's not happening. Here's a former naval officer, a graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy, who says it is happening, and he wants to tell the whole planet about it. So he's walking from Delaware to California, and as he said, he's in Missouri right now, so he's he's halfway there. What an amazing story. This story came to my attention. A friend of mine who's a great piano player here in the St. Louis area, Kurt Landis, he called me and he said, you've got to cover this guy. So I checked into it and got Tom and Lisa on it. And here we go. So we will periodically check in with the exploits of David Voigt as he walks across the country.